Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. What is the United Nations Children's Fund, commonly called UNICEF? What is UNICEF doing to provide services, emergency services, to many children in many dire circumstances in various areas around the world? We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other important issues. Welcome back to our program. Today we're taking a look at UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund, and what UNICEF is doing to provide emergency services to children. My guest today is an expert on UNICEF and on these services. My guest today is Ms. Sarah Crow. Ms. Sarah Crow is the Crisis Communications Chief with the United Nations Children's Fund. Ms. Crow has worked on three continents for various media like BBC, Sky News, the Independent London Sunday Times, and the Christian Science Monitor, as well as many others. Sarah Crow, welcome to today's Global Thank Connections you. program. Thank you very much. I appreciate you being with me today. UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund, is probably the best known of all UN agencies, I'm guessing, because of trick-or-treat for UNICEF programs and things like that. But when, what was UNICEF established to do? What is its basic mission? Well, UNICEF was born, like the United Nations, out of the ashes of the devastating Second World War mm -hmm. in December 40, 1946 and grew from being an emergency operation where children specifically were our mandate and we had to provide emergency assistance, food, clothing, some basic education response. And famously, uh, Audrey Hepburn, one of our Goodwill Ambassadors, was an early beneficiary um, of UNICEF's response just after the war herself. So UNICEF then transformed into what it is today, where we're development and humanitarian, and our focus is on children's rights, emergency issues. We're operational in 190 countries around the world, and we're there before, during, and after a crisis. Uh, and that's, I think, really the beauty of the United Nations, that we are a permanent presence in the world, a force for good, if you like. And as Doug Hammarskjöld famously said, the United Nations was created not to lead humanity to heaven, but to save it from hell. And we hope we're doing a lot more than that, too. Exactly. And that is very essential to help people when they're in a time of need. You mentioned Audrey Hepburn, a famous actress. Of course, Danny Kaye, a famous entertainer. And many other outstanding personalities have joined UNICEF to be goodwill ambassadors of UNICEF, to lend their names and to help uh, explain your programs and to promote them, which is very, very helpful. Speaking of programs, let's talk about the crisis communications. You're the crisis communication chief. What exactly do you do as far as evaluating or looking at uh, what qualifies as a crisis? Well, in many ways, it's an it can be an internal crisis, such as an attack on staff or, or UNICEF or property or that kind of thing. And these are the kind of sudden, unexpected onsets of, a, of an emergency uh, and continuing to be able to operate um, in such an emergency. That is one part of the work. The other part of the work is dealing with sometimes we know, for instance, the Ebola crisis was in a way a double crisis because it was a crisis for UN's ability and its mandate mm -hmm. to be able to deliver and to provide services in this extraordinary global health crisis. And it was also just a simple emergency. Well, not so simple, it was extremely complicated. So it was a dual emergency in that way. The migrants crisis is another one. These are kinds of crises that stretch UNICEF and the mm -hmm. UN beyond what we were originally meant to do. When it is multi-layered, it's complex, it involves industrialized countries in the case of the migrants crisis, which is erupting in the Mediterranean Sea and the Andaman Sea and even in Central America. So it's these kinds of hot spots that are multi-layered and multi-dimensional and not just affecting children, but of course families. And it's a push-pull, you know, you've got many different elements and efforts uh, involved there. So, so my 
job um, entails, both mm -hmm. of their talking about it, going there, uh, visiting, uh, bringing a human face, if you like, um, to the world on the Ebola crisis, Pakistan and polio last year, South Sudan, uh, mm -hmm. and many of those kinds of big emergencies hey, that continue. We're going to get to those in just a moment. Let's talk about Ebola for a moment. That was a horrific, horrific challenge mm -hmm. confronting UNICEF, the World Health Organization, Doctors Without Borders, a variety of different groups. Uh, what types of services, just br briefly, did you provide to uh, children or to people in that area, Liberia, uh, Sierra Leone, Guinea, areas that were heavily affected by the Ebola outbreak? Well, it was truly like nothing I'd ever seen before. You know, you asked me about being a journalist earlier. Nothing prepared us, I think, in the media, in the UN, uh, all the NGOs that were inv involved. MSF, of course, did, a, did an extraordinary job. But it has never hit us like this before, where our ability to actually operate on the ground was so compromised because we were not sure what would happen if our staff, uh, you know, got ill as well. And what UNICEF's role was, particularly in the case of Ebola, was communications. And this means social mobilization. In many ways, we learned from the great successes that we'll talk about in a while with polio, mm -hmm. and we applied them to Ebola. That means going house to house, working with the communities, winning over the communities, trying to understand the anthropology of what's going on in a remote area, mm -hmm. what certain practices had led to the Ebola outbreak. So for instance, unsafe burial practices, and then working with communities to help them try and change that. And this was, it would not have been possible to have come this far, although we're still teetering, of course, with a few cases now in Liberia having resurged, mm -hmm. uh, resurfaced. Um, we uh, collectively, and I mean we, all of the humanitarian actors, uh, managed to come back from the brink because we were looking at the possibility of some of these countries actually ceasing to exist. It was an existential threat to their very ability to survive as nations. Much like HIV was in Southern Africa when I was based there uh, 10, 15 years ago. So it, it was very similar in that sense. Exactly, and it's hard to realize that, but that is exactly what was confronting the people in that area. And of course, that not only destabilize or destroy that country, but it could destabilize the entire region and uh, go far beyond the boundaries. Let's move, uh, there are so many challenges out there and, and you have some very difficult tasks to perform. Uh, what about a country like Yemen? We see that Yemen is deteriorating with every passing day. The UN is about ready to declare it a level three disaster area. We won't go in the weeds on that, but what is going on in Yemen and what are you doing to provide assistance? Right. Well, sadly, if I could go back to 2014, mm -hmm. it was the most devastating year on record for children in crisis around the world. We had Syria, which is now effectively a chronic crisis, and it has engulfed an entire region. Uh, all of the Middle East, in one way or another, uh, is, is impacted by the Syrian crisis. It's also led to the migrants' crisis in the Mediterranean and beyond. So you can see how this kind of this domino effect uh, takes place when you have these chronic kind of emergencies that go on and, and the world is simply not able to, to, to pick it up, to take care, to, to assist as best, as, as best we can. So we had Syria, we had the Ebola crisis, we had the crisis in Central African Republic and South Sudan, one of the youngest nations on earth now facing its second year of, uh, of, of truly uh, an extraordinary situation there for children uh, who are constantly being recruited by armed groups and their very lives, their livelihoods are affected, their ability to go to school, to have safe drinking water, every aspect of their lives uh, is affected. So we have South Sudan and then now in 2015, we're sadly seeing more of these crises uh, that we're having, to, we're having to run to keep up and Yemen is the latest. Uh, and what we're seeing now, sadly, in Yemen, that already at the best of times had some very serious challenges. Uh, we're now seeing uh, many diseases, measles in particular, is threatening millions of children there, uh, children being out of school, and not being able to access children as a result of fighting. This is probably one of the biggest challenges for us. 
there used to be a time in history where UNICEF was able to negotiate what was known as you know, humanitarian pauses, is what we call them today, where you can ask the warring factors, factions to stop fighting in order to immunize children. This is becoming harder and harder to do now, simply because the kind of warfare is it's it's much more uh, it's much smaller. It happens in uh, it's very hard to predict. It's very hard to kind of pinpoint who are the actors involved, who you should talk to. It's low-level terrorism sometimes. So it's much much more complex than ever before, and as a result we are having to sprint to keep up. It's no longer a marathon, it's a constant sprint. Exactly, and our viewers can go to your website, www.unicef.org, to get much more information about the topics we're talking about today and many that we will not get to as we go through the program. You mentioned a minute ago about the children and how they're adversely affected. Of course, we saw the other day the UN came out with a new statistic saying they're dealing, uh, primarily UN High Commission for uh, Refugees, working with over 60 million refugees. It hadn't been like eight or 10 years ago, there were only 10 million refugees. This is a, a quantum leap because primarily because of natural disasters and because of the uh, the strife that's going on within these various countries. And sadly, I guess the, the big, everybody's a victim, but the greatest victims of this disaster in Yemen and Syria are really the civilians, especially women and children, are they not? Absolutely, and you know, children for one don't, don't understand what, what's going on in a situation where they have no control, their parents, the adults are not able to explain to them. So it's all, it, you've got that level of, uh, of disturbance and, and then on top of it just their everyday lives are shattered, not being able to go to school, not being able to have the routine that they need in their lives. You know, sometimes the most simple measure is just getting a child back into routine after a devastating event. It can be an earthquake, a flood, or ongoing war. If children have a sense of rhythm and routine in their lives, that gives them a sense of, of peace, if you like. Mm -hmm. And when they do not have that, that shatters their every days, but it also leaves deep, deep scars for the next generation. So that's why sort of bringing in the routine of schooling, uh, basic water and sanitation, making sure that the water gets out to refugee camps. In the case of Syria, you've got Zatari camp now in, uh, in Jordan, which has effectively grown into a small city because of the refugee crisis, that people are now having to stabilize their lives, the permanency in their lives now. So UNICEF's work is not only providing schooling and basic services for the children in the camps, but beyond the camps, and making sure that children who are not just in the camps, but ordinary Jord Jordanian children or Lebanese children mm -hmm. are also benefiting, because otherwise you can create uh, a lot of tension between the two different communities. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is an independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would encourage our viewers to go to www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, take a look at some and perhaps send us suggestions on future topics and future guests. My guest today is someone from the United Nations Children's Fund who provides disaster services to children in many areas of the world, and she is an expert on that. Ms. Sarah Crow has been working in this capacity for the past several years, and she is a crisis communications chief with UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund. Sarah, we're talking about a lot of bad news. We're talking about problems in Yemen, problems in Syria, what have you. But there is good news out there too. It's not all bad news, it's all not doom and gloom. And one piece of good news is with a study that UNICEF and the World Health Organization came up with, the 25, 25th Progress on Sanitation and Drinking Water, the 2015 Update and MDG, the Millennium Development Goals Assessment. What, a, what is the thrust of this I'm sure there are some there are some posi there are some positive news in here. Probably some areas where we need to improve. But what is the thrust of this study? There's a lot of good news, and you know one of the one of the big headline uh, items, if you like, is really that more and more children are at school. So the figure has gone from 106 million odd children being out of school to now down to 58 million. So so that is that is a tremendous progress has been made uh, in quite a short time. And those are the statistics that are hard to kind of prove uh, to the world out there because 
news, the nature of news is full of problems. So we're seeing more and more children in school, which is, which is terrific news. We're not seeing the quality of education that we need yet. Uh, so, so we're seeing numbers, but not, but not really quality education. Uh, more and more children are finishing right up to primary level and beyond. So now we need to get them into high school and keep them there. So with every goal that is reached, we have to go to the next level. Uh, what, what we're concerned about, of course, water is very good news too. Uh, more and more people have access to, to drinking water. The water goals, the Millennium Development Goals that were set for water well, have already been reached. So that is tremendous progress. Mm -hmm. Where there is lack of progress is in sanitation. Uh, and the big, the big areas of concern remain, to remain country like, like India, where you have more around 600 million people without access to decent uh, sanitation. Mm -hmm. I lived in India for, uh, for nearly four years. And to see that sort of the, the, the population and the challenges that children have, you know, if they do not have access to, to basic sanitation, mm -hmm. That is going to create all kinds of problems of diseases and, you know, just generally stunted growth uh, if they're not have if if they do not have a have a have basic sanitation. That means they will not be able to to have decent uh, a decent place to to wash, good hygiene, those kinds of practices. Sometimes very cheap and inexpensive hygiene practices like washing hands with soap can be so incredibly powerful and really prevent all kinds of illnesses uh, happening and, chi and children basically becoming stronger and more robust in their lives. So you have as a result very high levels of undernutrition, you have very high levels of stunting in countries that, that, that have high levels of, uh, of poor sanitation. This often, this often is an issue too. Uh, we used to say in back in 2009 that there were more mobile phones in India than there were toilets. Now we're looking at that figure for the world so, uh, so it is, you know, often the case in India. To India is a litmus test of where we're going in the development goals because of the sheer size of its population and and what it means in the world. Um, Africa, on the other on the other hand, is the youngest continent, and if we look if we look forward into 2050, uh, there are more young uh, Africans being born. Uh, than any other young people anywhere else in the world. So uh, by in, in 25 years, the next generation will have many more Africans, which means, of course, that uh, more children in Africa are surviving. So that's another bit of good news. We've seen countries like Ethiopia that not too long ago was in the, in, in the midst of an extraordinary historic famine. Today, mm -hmm. Ethiopia has managed to cut its child mortality rate by two thirds, and I saw for myself just in late 2013 why, and that was really about reaching out to the furthest, the hardest to reach children, mm -hmm. the hardest to reach communities, and developing a network of healthcare workers who were paid for, very small wages, but at least they had some value in their work. They were trained up in the most basic measures like hand washing with soap, learning how to help a, help a woman uh, during childbirth, uh, vaccination, oral polio drops, these kinds of things that are very simple for, for a health worker uh, uh, with, mm -hmm. with, some, with some low education to provide to the community. And a person who's from the community speaks the local language and so on. And this is really what's turned around, you know, sort of getting communities on board, whether it's polio, whether it's Ebola, whether it's child survival. If you don't get the communities on board, it's not going to be sustainable. That is absolutely key. So again, going back to the progress for children 2015, what we're seeing is really good news in many areas, but we're still seeing millions left behind. And we've got to focus on those children who are left behind now as we go forward. And this September, the, the General Assembly at the UN is going to be a really important milestone in putting children at the heart of the sustainable development goals and making sure they stay there, because if they're not at the heart of the goals, the goals will not be reachable. Exactly, and you mentioned about the 
situation with sanitation and uh, health facilities and what have you. And many of these services can be provided at very minimal cost. We're not talking about building a $12,000 or 10,000 year old bathroom or something like that that can be done for really just a, a small amount of money. So there are, there are opportunities to participate and to provide these services to help people to help themselves. You mentioned polio. There is another good example of a, a very successful program, the Polio Plus program, one of the largest, the largest international health programs in the world. It was launched by Rotary International in 1985. In 1987, the UN Children's Fund and the UN World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control got involved. This is a tremendous program to eliminate the scourge of polio. How important is that to get rid of polio from the face of the earth? Well, it's extremely exciting, actually, to see the, the progress being made on polio. When I first arrived in India in 2008, uh, there was something like 700 plus cases. When I left, and I wish I could claim some, some responsibility for that, uh, there was just one case. And now India has been polio free. This is now going into its fourth year. We're very excited as Nigeria looks like it could be the next, and that's just weeks away. If all goes as smoothly as it has gone in the past year. The last wild polio case we had in Nigeria was on the 24th of July. So the three endemic countries in the world, Nigeria, Afghanistan, and, uh, and Pakistan, this now means there's only two countries left. So the possibility uh, of, of actually eradicating another disease, which is truly historic, because the last one, of course, was smallpox, is so tantalizingly close now that we have to keep this going. And what it means, Polio Plus, you mentioned, was really learning from communities again, questioning, refusing, resisting, wondering why the health workers were only coming to them with polio drops very often in the very remote areas and starting to integrate those services. So in Pakistan last year, for instance, I was out uh, in beyond Peshawar and uh, what we're doing there with the government, uh, World Health Organization, Rotary, Gates Foundation, mm -hmm. it's a tremendous, tremendous public-private partnership, the biggest ever uh, mm -hmm. that has existed on this planet. And all joined up with the communities, you know, literally tens of thousands of community volunteers going door to door with the community, and so that you don't have any level of suspicion. You know, if you're going to be dealing with the person from the village, your village or the village down the road, you'll understand why they, they will be able to explain why it's necessary to keep on with the polio drops all the time. So the integration of other services, meaning that those health workers are able to talk to the local communities about the importance of mm -hmm. sanitation, of hygiene, of you know, all those kinds of basic life-saving measures. And now that this is, uh, this is being integrated into the messaging, into integrated into the community work uh, and the health volunteers, we're starting to see this tremendous progress. So we're very excited, but you know, one can't, it's not over until there are zero cases. Exactly. So we can't, uh, we can't let our eye off the ball yet. And the end game strategy, as we're calling it, uh, is now to use um, to use IPV instead of the old OPV, which is the oral polio vaccine drops you will have seen. Mm -hmm. And now it is the inactivated, which is of course injectable. And that means that that it is it is much more robust. That um, children will will have uh, you know their their armament, if you like, uh, will be will will be boosted by the double doses. So we're seeing now Pakistan has started, I believe just this week, uh, with the new IPV, and more and more countries are going online because this will help tip the scale. Exactly, and once the Polio Plus programs co program comes to fruition, which it will at some point, it's going to save like 50,000 children's lives every year. Tens of millions more won't be afflicted with the scourge of polio. Yeah. It will save taxpayers in the United States something like $250 million a year, and taxpayers around the world $1.5 billion a year that they will have money to put into other programs, health programs, transportation, whatever the case might be. But it is a significant program, and it really is going to make a, it has already made a tremendous difference yeah. in the lives of so many millions of people around the world. Well, in the last 30 seconds or so that we have left, what is the major challenge that you confront in your efforts to deal with the problems that you deal with on a daily basis and you have some major issues to deal with. Well, I think you, you've just <coughs> you've just 
pinpointed it, <coughs> and it's essentially about investments. The investments that have been made in polio are going to be, uh, are hopefully, uh, if countries and governments have learned anything, and we know, for instance, the Nigeria government <coughs> learned a tremendous amount from polio, which they applied to Ebola. If, they've l if we've learned anything from this massive global health crisis uh, caused from Ebola last year, mm -hmm. it is one thing. It's about investing in strengthening of these systems, the health system strengthening, really, and learning from communities, listening to communities and not coming in from outside and uh, forcing people to, do, to change behavior or whatever it is, and having a predictable... Uh, a predictable s f f uh, source of income and that means for the United Nations in general because we will only be able to do uh, as good a job as possible if we know that there's predictable income and with all these crises in the world today it's going to be <laughs> harder to do an excellent job if we don't have these kinds of resources and this commitment to political will resources and community involvement yeah, exactly and Sarah Croke Crisis Communications Chief with the United Nations Children's Fund. You're really doing some excellent work. There are so many other areas we could have touched upon. We could have talked about that devastating earthquake in Nepal. You lived in Kathmandu for a couple of years. You saw the, the people there and some of the, the terrain and the, the institutions there. But again, these are really important programs and our viewers need to go to www.unicef.org to learn much more about them. But I want to thank you so very much thank for you. a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you very much for paying attention to thank this. You. It's important. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.